I was writing a lot. I found that version of myself, you know, who loved the cute jewelry and I picked up some bracelets there made out of the olive wood from the olive trees. And it was really interesting. I found that like artsy girl who loved to write that kind of got buried under the one that had to like study so hard for her MCATs and go to med, like all the things that I gave up to go to med school. And I don't regret that, but like she was still there. And so it was really amazing. Welcome back to another episode of Seriously Catherine. Today I have with me my friend Dimphna Weil from Prescribing Possibility. She is a coach. She is an Irish dancer and she's also an OBGYN. So we have a lot to unpack here. This week is National Infertility Awareness Week. Dimphna and I talked about an experience I had last year with an ectopic pregnancy and how common they are and how business women like me may be impacted. My biggest takeaway from this episode was the validation that I should rest and I deserve to rest and I need it to be my best version of myself for my kids and for my businesses. Welcome to Seriously Catherine, a podcast about taking your business seriously, but not yourself. All right, so this week's hot take is all about seventh heaven. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but my brother and I watched that show growing up, and I feel like we were educated by Seventh Heaven. Um, and thinking back, there are things that I just did not know that were occurring on this show. I am in the process of re-watching Seventh Heaven with my children, and this actually started because Posey and I started watching Gilmore Girls, which in the beginning, we're on season three, and I think it is starting to get like maybe a little above Posey's head. She's she's nine, but it's so much fun. Like We were watching it together. It's like me and Posey's thing after the little girls go to bed. It's adorable. So my hot take revolving this this deep dive into my past is that Seventh Heaven does not stand the test of time. It is completely inappropriate. It is not evergreen material. So there's a there's another social media page that a friend of mine, another mom friend of mine, because I, t- I brought this up. We were at Dancing Grain a couple weeks ago, and I was like, I'm rewatching Seventh Heaven with my kids. And of course, they all were like, oh, my God, we watched Seventh Heaven, too. And so she shared about this social page. His name is Heartthrob Anderson. And he like deep dives and comments on all these old episodes. Like the one that we just watched last night was all about when the Camdens became allies to their neighboring black church. It's completely wrong. Like everything wrong. It's I just don't even I can't even articulate all the all the mishaps. First strange thing is that for every white member of the Camden family, they wrote a black character from the other family to match them. <laughs> Matched exactly to their age and gender, from like the pastor dad to the mom to the oldest son to the youngest daughter. It's creepy. It's like, why do they have to have black doppelgangers? They're like the tethered, except there's no match for Lucy, the forgotten middle child. This family, <laughs> this fam I don't know. I don't even know how to I don't even know how to address it. I was shocked when one of the kids got called the N-word. And I'm like, oh, my God, how was that even appropriate for, like, who was president at that time? We have to find out who was in charge of the FCC in 1996 because he was not or she was not doing a good job. Anyway, I'm going to continue down the seventh heaven rabbit hole. I mean, my family, we like to watch things and we like to in chronological order. So we are going to keep on going down this page of our, of my past and I think it's a good opportunity to address things there's a reason why it was canceled maybe maybe it just did it run it ran its course also it's interesting like Jessica Biel is the only one who got out of that alive also Eric Camden is like went to jail or something he did something he did something very f- shady and illegal with children you didn't know this the dad yeah pastor Camden Reverend Camden. And it's and it's a good opportunity to sort of like address the things, right? Like so that's my hot take. Come for me if you need if you must. Please send me messages of what you think. All right, so I am so excited to have you here. You're a special person, and I'm just like thrilled to share you with all the, the world listeners on this podcast. I'm so happy to be here and I love you. <laughs> Thank you. So can we can we first start at at the the well not the first time I met you but the first time you came to Palette mm-hmm. and I 
couldn't quite place where I knew you from. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you get this a lot as an OBGYN. Yes. I was like, why? (laughs) How do I know her? She looks so familiar. Like, I know her intimately. (laughs) (laughs) And I can't say anything. I just have to kind of. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Yeah, which is even more concerning right because because mm-hmm. it might have been like wait a minute I I feel like I know you from somewhere and you're just like um I don't know and I'm like wait but like where like can you help me out and you're like no not really and I was like oh <laughs> I know so the practice you were with and where I go especially when you're pregnant you just see a different doctor every time or a different nurse midwife or whatever it's just like a different person so mm-hmm. I may have seen you twice over the course of I don't know. I think it was you were there when I was pregnant with Posey. Yep. So over the course of 10 months of being pregnant, I might have saw you twice. So Probably. that is why I couldn't like initially I couldn't like place you. Right. But yep. tell us about that. Like how did how do you deal with that? Because it's like, yeah, you can't <laughs> the HIPAA laws keep you from acknowledging publicly that you're a patient's doctor. Is that how it is? It is. And so it's really kind of funny because you'll be out somewhere and you'll totally know them. Like even if it's somebody that you've seen multiple times and you both know that you know each other and you know from where, I can't say anything. So patients will be like, God, why is she acting so weird? Or, whoa, she's rude. You know, we just can't acknowledge you unless you say something to us like, oh, hey, Dr. Weil or, oh, you know, that type of thing. So once you acknowledge me, then I can talk to you, right? It's yeah. just that's just how the law is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I know it happens all the time. So, you know, I'll be out in town and somebody will come up and they'll say, Look, it's your baby. And when my when my daughter was <laughs> little, she'd be like, Um, hello, I'm your baby. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it's really it's honestly it's it's sweet and it's an honor and um yeah, it never really gets old. I just love meeting patients out and Is it hard yeah. <laughs> for you? I, I would I would feel like it would be hard for me to like help a woman give birth. You're catching the kid. Mm-hmm. You're catching the baby and then and then they're gone. And it's like you never see that baby again unless like that mother becomes a pregnant again you, and just back in your office or she brings the kid to the office. It's like you never see these babies again. So I'm like, I don't know. I feel like there's this really this. I sort of feel this way, like with my current uh, nurse midwife, Kelly. Mm. So that's who I see like on a regular That's who I see for my checkups. And then, you know, when you're pregnant, you see whoever and then whoever's there when the baby comes, you delivers it. But Kelly's my girl. She's my lady. Love Kelly. And then like my my therapist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like these are the types of people where I'm like, but don't you want to meet my children? Right. <laughs> like, don't you want to meet my husband? Like, don't you want to know them and see how grown up they're gum- becoming? And I'm sure you do. But it's like you can't. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, you feel very invested in like your patients and you know like all these things about them and then you don't get to see them. And it is although sometimes they'll bring their kids in like to their visits and so you do get to see the kids as they grow. But for me like even now I'll be in Target and I'll hear down the aisle like Dr. Weil and I'll be, I'll turn around and there's a patient and she comes with, you know, one of the kids that I delivered and then a couple that came after and it's really it is really sweet and yeah. you know. So, but yeah, it's a it's being a part of a really special part of of someone's life, of a family's life. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. It's awesome. And so, sometimes traumatic, sometimes, you know, s- amazing and mm-hmm. so I want to I'll get back to the, the my trauma story. Okay. Um, but I want to sort of like bring people through the timeline of like you moved up here, you're you're practicing and then something happened in your life where you were like, OK, we're pumping the brakes and we're going to pivot. And so tell us about that and, and how you came to that sort of like ultimate decision and where you're at now. Yeah. So um, I was in practice here. It was full scope OBGYN. My daughter was in kindergarten and I had this opportunity to take a position down at Bellevue, down in Niskayuna, which was um, to be an OB hospitalist, which basically meant I didn't, I wasn't taking call and seeing patients in an office, but rather I was 
in the hospital and working 24-hour shifts, basically covering labor and delivery and doing emergency surgeries. So I okay. was like almost like an ER OBGYN. Got it. Makes sense? Yeah. And I was doing the things that I really loved, which were was like delivering babies and that sort of thing. Um, the part I missed was having relationships with my patients. And that was the trade-off for having more time at home mm -hmm. with my daughter. The upside was I got to start my Irish dancing school and do some other things that I really had missed. And I did that for several years. And then um, 2020 needs no introduction to anybody. Um, and so six months into the pandemic, I started having really weird symptoms myself, not COVID symptoms, but just weird symptoms where I was having these terrible headaches in the back of my head. It, I just didn't feel right, and I didn't know why. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had these symptoms where I was, like, feeling out of my body. There's no other way I can kind of describe it. It's really difficult to explain. And it all culminated on September 18th. I can remember the date, and it was a Friday, and I was working on labor and delivery down at Bellevue. And it should have tipped me off because it was a very, very – like low key day, which is never how it is when I'm there. Like you can ask anybody that ever worked with me, never not busy. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I just really felt off. And I started having this throbbing pain in the back of my head that just kept intensifying. And all of a sudden in the afternoon, evening, I just started like not being able to process things. So the lights were bothering me and the sounds were bothering me and the nurses were asking me questions and I couldn't under like process or understand what they were saying. The residents were talking to me. It was almost like my brain was the screen of your computer when like all the inputs are there, but like that wheel of death is spinning and yeah. like nothing's happening. Mm. That was my that was me. And I had this throbbing pain that like was the worst pain in my head ever. So um, I called to have one of my colleagues take over for me. I went to the emergency room because they checked my blood pressure and it was super high. And um, I never went back to work. Well, like, was it like panic attack? sort of experience or did you feel like you were like having a heart attack or like what like or and as a as a physician it's mm -hmm. like if you don't know what what's going on like you know what I'm saying like how would anybody else know what's going on right so um looking back I think the blood pressure and all of that like that part was probably a panic attack right because I had no idea what was happening to me mm -hmm. and then because it was COVID times was the like beginning and middle of that really deep pandemic time. It took me, you know, nine months, ironically, <laughs> to get a diagnosis um, for what was actually happening with that whole like input business. Yeah. And so um, it turned out to be vestibular migraines and this really odd vestibular condition called 3PD. Okay. I'm like, I'm going to but butcher it now, but it's like a persistent postural positional dizziness. And basically, it's like a maladaptation to in your like balance system. Okay. All that to mean, I couldn't tell up from down, I'd move my head and just be off. Like, I was on the couch. Like, wow, that was it. So, um, so and it took you nine months to, to get a diagnosis. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's gonna be so stressful. Yeah, in a pandemic and like you're not working and you're getting emails like, when are you coming back to work and what's the schedule? And they're like, I can't stand up. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't know what's wrong with me. Yeah. And then well-meaning people, colleagues are like, well, if this is something you can just take a pill for, meaning like, is it just anxiety? Like, get over yourself. <laughs> like, you know, take it and move on. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I wish. <laughs> yeah. It's not that. Right. Like, because you enjoyed what you were doing. It wasn't like you were going to work every day dreading it. You you yeah. enjoyed what you were doing. There so. were certainly things I would want to change about it. Don't get <laughs> right. me wrong. Right. Yeah. You know, the system of medicine completely needs an overhaul. Mm -hmm. Let's not like dilute ourselves. And we were in a really stressful time. Right. We had no PPE. There was like a lot of stuff that was really stressful. Yeah. But if I wanted to leave my job, I wanted to leave on my own terms for my own reasons. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, this was not that. Yeah, yeah. But silver lining, mm. it's sort of like 
led you to this other sort of chapter in your life where you're focusing on wellness. Mm -hmm. I think you you clearly have discovered a lot about yourself and and how to heal. Yeah. And it's interesting because it was something I had been working on before. You know, two years prior, I had started the clinician wellness initiative at my organization. So it was something that I had really been interested in prior to all of this happening. It was like, how do we help each other, like, handle all of the the heavy stuff that we see in Mm -hmm. OBGYN? So we started like a, a support group for one another and that sort of thing. So When this happened and I was at home with my brain, (laughs) like bored, but not feeling well, I'm like, I have to figure out, like, why is this happening? Like, there has to be a reason. Yeah. You know, I had never sat still in my life. Like, what am I going to do? So, you know, I was very fortunate. I had a great therapist who helped me because I needed that. It was a major change in my identity. Like if I'm not seeing patients and I'm not working, like what good am I? I mean, yeah, yeah, it's like existential crisis sort of identity. Yeah. Figuring out and it's scary. Very much so. So when I got over the like initial um the depths of that, then it was like, okay, Like, well, how do I do something positive with this? Mm -hmm. And then I started looking into, um, you know, mindset and that sort of thing. And so I took a course with Martha Beck. Oh, Oh, my gosh. I love her. What is the book? Wait. Finding Your Own North Star. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I read it. It's pretty woo-woo. But it's like really made me contemplate Mm -hmm. what my thoughts were telling me. Yeah. And she's like, she will even say like... She is like Harvard meets Hogwarts, you know, it's but she's brilliant. And she yeah, she does a great job of like matching it to science and matching it to Mm -hmm. fact. And it it, it's not just like crystals and energy and Mm -mm. and the universe has your back. It's like it's like but but actually (laughs) astrology is science and this is all it's all connected. Yeah, she is hardcore into, like, back it up with data. Yeah. And so I took her life coach course, and it really allowed me to see the possibilities for myself. And then I started sharing all of those life hacks with other physicians during the pandemic to help them see and get through, because they were everyone was burning out, you know? Right. Patients didn't want to get vaccinated. There was just so much... So much pressure. Oh, my Lord. And... Um, yeah, pressure to show up, pressure to have your shit together while everyone else is, you know... People are sick. I mean... Everyone's sick. Family members, your patients... People are dying. It's just... It was terrible, right? It and was. So, and we're in New York. I mean, like, we got... We had lots of stuff going on. So, yes. Um, so I felt like I wasn't caring for my patients, but I was caring for my colleagues in a different way. So right. I was doctoring still. Yeah, yeah. You like became a doctor coach. Yes, I did. It was really very fulfilling. And so I pursued my um, my master coach certification with Martha. And that was amazing. Do you get to meet Martha? The mas- Yeah, we my, the master coach program was very intimate. There were only 12 of us and wow. we'd be on calls with her and she's just every bit as magical as you would think. Wow, I love that. Well, they say sometimes like don't meet your heroes or don't meet the people who you admire or you look up to because they're going to disappoint you. But no. it doesn't sound like she did that. No. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm so happy for the for you to like have that experience and now you're sharing it. Mm-hmm. She only is going to reach so many people, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just like it is important for you to share your message and you know your experience and your wisdom because some, you know, what you you could be saying the same thing, right? Mes- messaging, but because it's coming from you, people are paying attention. This is why she teaches, right? Because she wants the her messages and and then those to be shared in different ways. Yeah. Like that's she's a teacher. Yeah. Really, ultimately. Right. During our training, part of it is to kind of go on your own hero's journey and um, you have to share something at the end. And so part of my journey was I realized I really wanted to write a book. More on that later. One of my um, classmates, Suzette, whom I just completely adore, she wanted to run a retreat. And she wanted to do that in Majorca because she had, like, family ties there. 
so she was putting it together in this very short time crunch and she was getting really nervous and all of these things but she was she was making it happen like that's the magic of doing these things with Martha like you learn how to take your your dream and make it happen like that's part of the magic of working with her is that that's what we learn to do and then we do that with our clients yeah well and you have the support around you as you're attempting to do this thing right because if we can't do it ourselves like how are we going to help somebody else do it so this is why we do the program right so that we can then help yeah. others do it yeah so um, well, and it's like that in life too where it's like people don't even feel like they have the authority to, to tell people what to do or to coach them unless they've experienced it right mm -hmm. so i so, sometimes like deal with that also where it's like who am i to tell anybody what what i think now the way i sort of approach it is like most of everything i talk about is from my own experience and look at all the things that you've done and created, Catherine. I don't look at it as that. Like, y yes, those are, you know, yeah, I, cre I founded Palette and it was an idea and now it exists and is a physical space and all this sort of thing. But I look at it more about like sharing my story, sharing my experiences, sharing vulnerably like w and authentically and transparently what I'm working on or what I'm attempting to accomplish with people allows them it gives them permission to also do that mm -hmm. and then we can do all this fun stuff together I'm not like self-deprecating like oh you know palace no big deal it is a big deal and it's had a huge impact but it's not it's not my own it's a community and we're all sort of contributing and creating I mean, it's so much bigger than me now. It's not even, it's like, I mean, it always was this bigger idea than, than me. But that's that's sort of my approach in life at this point. You know, it's like, I, I don't want to do things alone because that's boring. And I will more likely succeed in whatever I'm trying to, comp trying to accomplish if people know that I'm doing it mm -hmm. and they also feel part of it. Absolutely. And... Think of the ripple effect then that you have when you bring those people aboard and you do it together because now they feel empowered to do things in their lives and then that affects their circle. Right. And then that just goes out. And then you have no idea the number of people that you've influenced. I mean, you may know the people that you've taken along on the ride in one way, but you have no idea how that's influenced them to do other things and the other people's lives that have been affected. Right. Yeah. And I think well, this is like, I am going to hold it together. Okay. But last week I had a high school friend pass away. I'm sorry. Right after her 38th birthday. And, you know, so obviously the group text start about like, oh, my God, like it's just like people I haven't spoken to since high school, but like makes me think like, well, do they know how impactful they were? Like even if even if you don't talk to someone since high school, mm -hmm. there was a huge part of your life that they were part of, you know, so it's just like got me all not fucked up, but just like contemplating and thinking like, oh, my God, yes, like even the smallest little blip in someone's life has an impact and mm -hmm. it shows them. I mean, this the one thing that I can remember about this girl is that she always showed up. Like literally she is in every fucking photo, every high school photo, every dance photo, every everything. It's, it's so wild. And it's like, we weren't the best of friends, you know, but we were in the same circles and it's just so wild to me. Like what an impact that is like, and mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you take it for granted and sometimes, you know, I want, I just wonder, like, do you know the impact like in life? You know what I'm saying? Like, do you know the impact that you're making on people's lives? And I'm huge on like being kind and showing kindness and sharing kindness. And I think cause it's important, it's important and um, it makes an impact, you know? So anyway, just that was my little tangent, <laughs> but it's so wild how the smallest little thing can have this ripple effect. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that there's, it's important to remember that there is a difference between being nice and then really just letting kindness prevail, right? Like you can be nice to everybody, but like truly being kind is a totally different thing. All right, let's bring it back to business. The audience may be wondering, like, how do you apply being kind and caring to your business or to your career? It's a choice, right? So if those are your values, to be kind and to be caring, then that's what you lead everything with. So I don't think that it's 
necessarily different than how you just live your life, mm-hmm. right? So for me, my whole purpose is just to lead with love, right? That's how I do everything in my life. So I just, try. that's what I try to do anyway, right? Like when I was practicing, it's just take care of everybody the way I would take care of like my d- nearest and dearest, Yeah, you know, do the very best I can, like treat everybody with kindness and fairness. And that's kind of how I do everything. Like when I'm take, doing my work, like I'm taking care of those clients now, just showing them the utmost respect and kindness, right? Yeah. It's everything is just driven by love and kindness. And I try now to also show that to myself, right? Because it has to be shown to ourselves. We have to take care of ourselves. Right. Right. And it's when, and I think women in particular don't necessarily do that inherently, no. right? We just right. Right. keep oh, going. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, so that's exactly what happened to me in August, right? Like I was go, go, going. I wasn't t- like checking in with myself or, you know, paying attention to my body. And I know that sounds like, well, how do you not know? Like you were breathing. Like I hold, I was hold. like I, now I recognize and acknowledge like when I'm holding my breath, I do that. I'll, I do that. That's like one of my things or I just like won't breathe. I'll just like hold my breath. And I don't even realize I'm like sitting at a computer and Marcella tell me like, did you just, did you take a breath yet <laughs> today? You know, so in August, I was not feeling well. I was feeling tired, like exhausted, like more so than usual, just fatigue. I thought it was like, oh, well, we were just in New Orleans traveling for a wedding and we were drinking. And well, it was Monday evening. Like I was about to go to sleep and I passed out. And I was like, oh, God. And so I went and lay down on the bathroom floor to cool off because it's tile. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I feel better now. Went and got in bed. And at around 11 o'clock, I woke up again, but felt like I was going to pass out. So it's like I woke up and then I was like, oh, God, I feel overheated. Went to the kitchen to get water. And on my way back to my room, I passed out. Thank the baby Jesus that Posey woke up and found me. And she kind of like brought me back and got me an ice pack and water. She was scared, so scared, but so strong to like keep it together during this time. I was like, oh my God, I don't even know what was going on. I was like, I think I'm just tired. I must be dehydrated. So like long story short, I got myself to the hospital and come to find out it's like, no, it's not dehydration. Your belly, your abdomen is bloated. There's fluid in your abdomen. They did an ultrasound. Is there a chance you'd be pregnant? I'm like, I... I don't think so, but, you know, I just started my period on Saturday, and this was on a Monday. And they were like, we're going to bring you to the emergency surgery, you know, because we got to explore what's going on. You're obviously, they have fluid inside of you. We need to get that out, and then we'll figure out what's next. And I'm just like, okay, well, what are all the things it could be? Like, I'm like, worst case scenario. And I'm there by myself because this is the middle of the night. My sister-in-law came and sat with the, came with the kids, and Mark was traveling for work. Mm-hmm. So I was like, is this is this the time that I should call my husband? And they're like, yes, yes, you should, you should call someone to come here with you because we're bringing you to surgery. And um, Dr. Verliger did it. Mm -hmm. Um, It ended up being a ruptured fallopian tube from an ectopic pregnancy. They took like three liters of blood out of my body. Mm -hmm. They gave me iron in the IV the next day because my, what what are those numbers weren't up? Your hematocrit. Right. So like when I came out of surgery, like the levels were fine or they were high and they were enough to where I couldn't qualify for blood. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get blood until the next day. But it was like a total shakeup. And I bring this back just because it was like, clearly I was not paying attention. Like I thought I had started my period, but really I was bleeding to death. (laughs) <laughs> like like I was maybe partially miscarrying and, and bleeding and added, I don't know, it was crazy. Yeah, it, that's, it sounds so traumatic. This is the other part though, is like, so that, that happened, had the surgery and I'm like, okay, well, I gotta get back to work. And they're like, no, no, you need time. Like this mm-hmm. is like, you probably need like a good two weeks of rest, like bed rest, do nothing and rest because your body needs time to sort of like reproduce blood and you need time just to to get well like get better and I was not having that I was like well I got shit to do I got bills to pay I got you know like a party to go to or work to you know whatever it was I was like I just I can't and I have three kids so I'm like there's no like sitting around twiddling my thumbs you know so it was really a shake up mentally because I had to like acknowledge that like I'm not superwoman and I also it's okay for me to rest and it's like I'm I'm 
I'm entitled to doing that. And I, like, my body physically demanded it at that point. Like, mm-hmm. I couldn't even, like, walk to the bathroom. I was so exhausted because, like, you know, there was no blood in my body. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, these are all things you probably see or experience on the other side of things on a regular basis. But mm-hmm. I don't think people, like, I had no idea the risks of this happening. And I think like when you're pregnant, you do hear about ectopic pregnancies, but you're like, that's not going to happen to me. Or do you tell me like, I feel like when people are trying to get pregnant, they're more aware, right? Or yeah, I think unpack this for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I and wrap it up in a bow. <laughs> I think that um, I think that people when they are trying to get pregnant might be a little bit more aware. But I, I think that we just inherently don't want to think about those types of outcomes. Right. I think a lot of us women want to just believe that pregnancy comes easily or should come easily and should result in a normal, healthy pregnancy. But but the reality of it is... That doesn't, That's not the case. Like no. most people have a hard time getting pregnant, right? Well, I would, or is it is it is it like environmental at this point? No, I would just say like that it is super common for women to have at least one miscarriage in their lifetime. Like they're much more common than people know or admit to. Although I think there's much more dialogue around that now. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting we're recording this now that we're about a week away from National Infertility Week. That's the end of April. But ectopics aren't really that discussed in the whole big scheme of things. Now, if somebody comes in to the office or calls and they said, yeah, I missed a period, I'm spotting, I'm having a little bit of pain, that to us as, and you know, as a midwife or a physician will say, oh, all right, well, let's maybe check some blood work because we want to see that your hormone levels are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. You know, that might be what we'll do just to make sure that it looks like it's a normally growing pregnancy um, because we know it's there's a possibility that it could be an ectopic. A much higher possibility that it's a normal pregnancy, but... Um, and we certainly don't want to be causing undue anxiety for an already anxious pregnant woman, but right. we want to check on it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's scary. Ectopics it was... are like your nightmare, our worst nightmare. Like we, when we hear I'm in pain and I have a positive pregnancy test, we're like, oh, because they're horrible. Like we are as anxious as you are because they can be so devastating like devastating i mean and deadly people people die of ectopic pregnancies like not getting to the hospital on time losing too much blood surgery gone bad not like, coming in or like, not not even showing up just saying oh i'm just tired not knowing they're pregnant not checking a pregnancy test you know right like thinking it's just a cyst not yeah. seeking care like well oh, so that that's a whole nother freaking part of it because i had i felt like shit mm-hmm. I, I remember we traveled on sunday got back monday mark went to work monday morning like 3 a.m got the kids to school and i remember telling marcella monday morning at our meeting i'm just like i am exhausted like next level tired but i told myself i was like well i'm home alone with the kids i'm not gonna go to the emergency room and sit in an er room waiting for somebody to be like you're just dehydrated and if i feel this shitty in the morning after i get to kid the kids to school i'll go to urgent care or call ob i li- was like it was in denial like mm-hmm. i had no like I just wasn't going to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, I drove myself to the hospital. And I remember they, the the poor little girl in the front, like ER receptionist was like, you drove here? Like, have you looked at yourself in the mirror? You look, you look very unwell. And I'm like, yeah, I feel tired. I'm just so, I feel I'm about to pass out. And that's what I felt. I felt like just this like sense of like, I, Catherine, like I just didn't know what was wrong with me. You had already passed out. I had already been this. That Twice, would have been the fourth. The fourth three yeah. Or four so it was. Times. Yeah. It was, and that's what I remember her saying that too. She's like, "You've passed out three times in the last two hours." So think about that, though, right? So like, here you were. You had already passed out three times at home. 
And you didn't even think that that warranted, like, bothering 911 to come get you in an ambulance. Right. My sister-in-law was like, we need to call the police. So, like, like you, need to, you need to ride. And I'm yeah. like, you know what? I think I'm just going to FaceTime you to the hospital. I live across the street. It's going to be fine. I don't want, you know, to wake up the kids. I don't want to create drama. Like, isn't that crazy? That I know, repeating this. But, like, seriously, mm-hmm. that's what I was thinking the whole time. Was like, I didn't want to inconvenience anybody. I felt horrible that I had to call my sister-in-law to come over. I just didn't want to be in the way and then the other part of this whole like saga was like I had to be told several times like people die from this people have died you almost died you lost a lot of blood and people die from not having enough blood in their body like I had to have like a coming to Jesus with my friend Dr. Astruck because like a week later I'm like I am not feeling better can you meet me at Four Winds like I think I need something just to kind of like knock me back into the swing of things he's like you don't need to go to Four Winds you're having a normal reaction to almost dying and people have like it had to be like reiterated to my thick skull that (laughs) I was like not okay yeah it's scary it was crazy yeah and then it's just one of those things that like when it finally sinks in then it's like now you're realizing like how close that really was for you and then it really because I think I remember I came in to palette around that time yeah it was just like coincidental I walked in it was crazy yeah I was like oh my god I almost died (laughs) Yeah. And I remember you asking me, like, people really die? And I said, I was yeah, skeptical. It's like, it, it's like the number one reason. Yeah. It's no, like I had Ali topic. Doyle had to tell me this, too. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I need several uh, experts to tell me that, like, that was not overreacting. That was, like, no. legitimate. I, yes. Yeah, so there's, like, so many layers to this. And I don't know why, but I also just feel like death is always around me or always like some people who are like, oh, you know, when you start to think about your own mortality, you know, it might trip you up a little bit. I'm like, I'm always thinking about my own mortality. <laughs> like since then, I'm just like always thinking like, oh, my God, I could die tomorrow or somebody could die tomorrow. Like I'm just always I feel like I've been to like so many funerals this year already. I just like surrounded by death. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just like a, it's it's just in my life. And so it forces me to sort of like always be contemplating. Well, I think it's it's a heaviness that you that we carry with us when we get to a point of like experiencing something so close. Yeah. You know, especially that close when I mean, yeah, it's clearly had like such a I mean, how could it not have such a deep impact on you? Yeah, I mean, it it was just a wild, wild sort of thing. And then. And then the one thing I also kept on thinking, I was like, well, they're not going to let me die here you know, in the hospital. I'm like, they're not going to let me die. And I remember like somebody saying like, well, no, that's never the intention. <laughs> to, to, it's never the intention to let anyone die. Like, I think right before we went into surgery, I was like, Dr. Furler, I'm like, you're not going to let me die. Right. And she's like, that's not that's not what we're trying. We're trying to keep that from happening, you know. But she also needed to sort of like let me know that the se- like the severity of it, and that I should probably call my husband. Yeah, he should probably be there. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, I want to bring it back to a little more positivity. Well, I just want to interject before you do. Okay, okay, and make sure that you are taking good care of yourself now. Well, I've certainly made some changes. Okay, like we we scaled back the business, which I've always sort of hated that term, scale back. But we have one less location mm-hmm. and um, a lot less overhead and mm-hmm. a lot less stress. Mm-hmm. And so that's like the main event, right? Is that like I'm taking taking and not not necessarily like taking things off my plate, but just reorganizing and reprioritizing and shifting roles and responsibilities so that I can check in with myself and I can tap in and see like, okay, am I breathing? (laughs) Am I, am I feeling okay? That's awesome. Yeah. Education is huge. Like I thought, Mm -hmm. okay, they, they took out a fallopian tube. So what does that mean? Like, am I, am I not able to have any more children? Mm -mm. Nope. I have another fallopian tube. You do? Yeah. And it's more like a magnet than anything. It's not like, I think maybe you told me this. You're (laughs) like, you have another fallopian tube. And it's like, I mean, obviously like doc, they told me I had this other fallopian tube before I left the hospital, but, (laughs) but 
I am young, so they weren't going to, like, give me a full-on hysterectomy or, like, they're, mm-hmm. you know, I remember she said that before in a surgery, but she's like, yeah, the the a woman's body is is absolutely incredible and mm-hmm. you know it's sort of like i didn't i always thought like the fallopian tube was connected and it's not it's more like like a magnet yep and so the little egg just like goes it floats it does and it can float to the other side in fact they do that anyway they even do if that you anyway. have two yeah okay so let's circle back to what you're doing now okay and <laughs> your the trip you're planning to mallorca Oh, okay. So in October, people like yourself who could use a little bit more ease and rest in their lives um, can join us in Majorca. So it's wellness retreat. I hate using the word wellness retreat because that kind of implies that it's like you're going to wake up and you're going to do yoga and you're going to drink power smoothies or like people have a pretty whatever it is in their head, like they have a preconceived notion of what a wellness retreat is, and it's like not that. So first of all, I kind of cringe at the word retreat myself. Like I'm not a retreat person. I went to Majorca two years ago to attend this retreat that my friend Suzette created during our master coach program. And I went to support her. But I also went because it was part of my healing journey, I hadn't really done much traveling. I certainly hadn't done anything kind of on my own on because own, yeah. of my um, vertigo dizzy business. And my best friend, Erica, said, you know, you don't have to go alone. We'll go together and I'll help you. Like, I'll travel with you. Yeah. And we went and it was amazing. And um, the premise was, you know, you don't come with a label. So it's not like, oh, hi, I'm Dimna, I'm a doctor, which I don't say anyway, but like, you know, we introduce ourselves by what we do a lot of the time. This was just like, hey, I'm Dimna, how are you? You know, and we didn't really talk about any of that. And it was just, why are you here? And I'm here just to kind of like try to Do something new, Uh, heal, rest. That's right. And the whole purpose was rest, play, repeat. Find a little fun, get back in touch with who you are, that type of thing. And Suzette did a marvelous job of like creating that like container. program. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really like you get from it what you want. And um, so it was amazing. And while I was there, I couldn't really participate in some of the activities just because of my own business. And I didn't care. Like I got what I needed. Yeah just sitting in like a cute little port city while they went out on a boat and I was writing a lot and um, I found that version of myself you know who loved the cute jewelry and I picked up some bracelets there made out of the olive wood from the olive trees and you know it was really interesting I found that like artsy girl who loved to write that kind of got buried under the one that had to like study so hard for her MCATs and go to med, like all the things that I gave up to go to med school. And I don't regret that, but like she was still there. And so it was really amazing. And after it was done, um, Suzette said, I'm gonna do another one of these, but I need you to work with me. And so we're running this one together in October. Oh, so much fun. I implore people to travel by themselves. I implore people to do things by themselves just just because they can. And it's so empowering. Like I went to the movies last night by myself and I sat by myself, not only by myself to the movies, but in the theater by myself. Mm-hmm. And it's so much fun. Just hold the th- had the whole theater to myself. Oh, isn't that awesome? I felt like a queen. That's right. Yeah. yeah. A badass queen. Thank you. And I do think that going somewhere by yourself or even if you go with a friend doesn't matter, but like seeing another place and going with the intention of like just spending that time for yourself. There's something really like empowering about that. You yeah. Know? Well, and having no expectations. You may not come home having discovered a new business concept or, you know, re- re- any sort of like realization, but mm-hmm. you rested and that's enough. Right. And that's the whole point, right? Like, so 
we may have all these like curated all of these wonderful things and you don't have to do any of it. Like oh, if fun. you want to go and just hang out and enjoy the sunshine. Yeah. So be it. You want to awesome. go shop in the cute little towns? Fine. Like there is no expectation and that's part of it too. Like you take from it what you need or want yeah, from it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so no fun. judgment. So how do people get a hold of you? Your coach, mm-hmm. for visit, a physician coach. I am. Um, and also other professionals. Like I've worked with lots of other people in different um, domains as well. But um, I just, I think inherently am drawn to physicians just because it's a s- similar language, you right. know? It's so um, I understand that experience. Um, so through my website and it's uh, dimnawile.com. Okay. We will put that in the show notes and so people can go and learn about your coaching practice and mm-hmm. this trip coming up they can. in October. Mm-hmm. I think we should get some palette people to show up. It'll be so much fun. That'd be awesome. Um, and then I don't know. I don't even know what I'm doing in the next hour, let alone in October. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, if any palette people do sign up, then um, they should let me know and I would be happy to give them um, two free uh, coaching sessions, oh, one cool. be- one before we go and one after. Oh, yeah, that'll be fun. Okay, so in addition to physicians, what type of client or, or what pain points do they have Like that would be an ideal client for you? Well, I think it is the person who kind of lost part of themselves in – their professional growth or development or in becoming a mother. You Mm -hmm. know, they've just kind of lost who they are or they've lost track of where they're going and maybe feel stuck. So it's that's kind of broad, but that's that's kind of where they're at. Like they're like, I've arrived at what I wanted and now what? Now still not really feeling fulfilled. Yeah. Like what? This is it? (laughs) You know? Um, Yeah. That's my jam. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's like most women, I would say, <laughs> who are like, yeah, like women, moms, maybe even like you've got the job, you've got the career, mm-hmm. you got, you know, you got the lifestyle you've always dreamed of, but you're Not just happy. like, well, wait, what? Yeah. But, 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 but there's still something missing. Right. And it may just be you're, you're missing yourself. Right. And that can be for a lot of different reasons. Mm-hmm. And you keep searching outside of yourself for that happiness, that joy, that peace, and it, you're never going to find it outside of yourself. It's here somewhere, and it's a matter of trying to figure out what it is. And you have the answer somewhere in there. Right, but you can't always get there by yourself. Like That's You right. do need someone to pull that out of you. And sometimes it's like you can't just read a Martha Beck book. To figure it out. You need right. like a human. Yeah. And sometimes a it's just, yeah. yeah, it's really like holding space for that person and asking the questions that can be really uncomfortable that you don't want to answer um, or think about. Um, and you need, sometimes you just need somebody who is not invested or in your life so intimately, like your friends or your family who have no agenda other than to just be there as a sounding board. Yeah. So yeah. that's where I come in. Why are you uniquely qualified to do this work? Well, I think I've kind of been a coach my whole life, but I didn't identify as that. Um, you know, if I go back to when I was teaching Irish dancing, I was coaching. If I go back to, um, you know, med school, I was coaching classmates and helping them. If I go you know, back to residency, I was teaching med students and kind of helping them in that way. And the same when working with patients in the office. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it's any different than who, I think it's who I am. It's just using that skill set now more intentionally um, and then picking up some really um, skillful uh you know, modalities for Martha. <laughs> yeah. And then working on them and tweaking them and then coming up with some of my own that I've kind of gleaned um, 
with experience now yeah. that I've found to be really useful. So Yeah, and you've been through it. I mean, I just feel like yeah. the best coach is someone who's been there, done that, who can sort of dispel the wisdom and, and knowledge to help someone go through it less alone and not as with, with as much hardship. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have so many different experiences in your life and you're like, you know, I'm going through this for a reason. And I really believe that, you know, my grandmother always used to say like, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. That was always something I struggled with, especially when I was younger, um, because my mom was an alcoholic. We won't have to go into all of that. But growing up, that was really hard to take. And I was like, seriously? Like, as a kid, you're just like, come on. <laughs> like, this is a little much, you know? Yeah. But I really believe that that's true because that shaped who I was. I think that helped me develop so much more empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of things that, like, helped make me who I am. And I think a lot of the experiences that I had along the way, good, bad, or otherwise, sometimes completely horrible, are the things that, like, they all led me to develop some of the skills and some of the qualities that I bring to my coaching, that I just bring to my interactions. Yeah. Um, so I really think that things happen for a reason, even yeah. if it's horrible and it is, and, and we can't see that at the time. That's my own belief, you know, but. Everything happens for a reason and God doesn't give you anything you can't handle. Those are two like really tough things to sort of like grapple with. Cause it's like, I mean, it's what we tell ourselves to get through the experience, totally. right? Like it's like, it's sort of like a survival instinct or a survival message that you tell yourself just so you can withstand whatever hardship you're going through. Yeah. But there's this other piece of it. It's like, well, like I don't want it to be hard, you know? Like, and like just because I can take it doesn't mean I should be taking it, right? And I've often said that to myself in the heat of the moment, yeah. right? But then with a little bit of time, it becomes a little bit truer, I find. Mm -hmm. You know, like in the heat of the moment, you're like, seriously? Like, what the hell? <laughs> Like, right. this isn't this isn't fair. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. And, yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. But it's like but then you also wouldn't change it. No, because with time, you can see like that was the most horrendous thing. And it was awful in every single way. And it also gave me the, that experience for a reason. Like I not that like I deserved it, not that it was intentional, like none of that. But like I gained so much and I learned so much. And if nothing else, I learned how to care better for myself. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, I learned that that's not how I want to be in the world. Yeah. You know, there's something and I just maybe it's just that I look for that. Well, and that's also what helps your client helps you help your clients look for that. I think so. I and think that's exceptional. So. I mean, I think some people can't see the forest through the trees. You yeah. know what I mean? Like they they have a hard time recognizing okay, it sucks right now, this is really hard, but on the other side of it, you're going to have this experience to, to build off of and mm -hmm. to help others. Right. Well, and our brains are primed to look for the negative. That's what they do. Really? Yeah. Is that true? 100%. So, so is my is my brain working overtime to always find the the hope and the positivity and the silver lining? No, it's well trained to do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, I don't even it's know. A skill. Yeah. It's a skill set. So I will put that on my resume. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. I could talk to you forever. There's so many layers to, to you and your expertise, and I hope you'll come back. I adore you, and I would be honored. Thank Yay. you for having me. Thank you. This week from Saratoga Living After Hours, I am here to tell you all about this event, which I'm so excited about. It's called Breaking Bubbles. It's in support of Double H Ranch. It's at Franklin Square Market, which is really exciting because we were actually just there for a Girl Scout troop booth, Girl Scout cookie booth. So shameless plug to buy some Girl Scout cookies because we still got tons of boxes to sell. And I know the prices went up, but that's not on us. And it's not on the girls and they need your support. So get cookies. Hit me up if you need some cookies. We got plenty. But Breaking Bubbles is at Franklin Square Market. It's on Tuesday, May 14th from 5 to 8 p.m. There's going to be silent auction items, which it, one will include a membership to Pallet. So you should totally show up. But what I'm most excited about is the keynote speech is 
by former Cosmopolitan editor-in-chief Kate White, who, I don't know if you would know this, but did a digital event with us during COVID. We were supposed to have her as our keynote for the Shiro Summit we did. Like, this is an event we did years and years ago. And then COVID happened, so she's still, like, tuned in via digitally. But I'm excited for her to be there and talk to us about what her life is like now since leaving Cosmo and she's retired but she's writing books and she's just so fascinating she's the most fascinating woman she went to Union and she's from upstate and so I'm excited to see her and you should get tickets they're I think $150 per ticket you can buy them online also a theme you know how much I love a theme so you must come wearing a shade of rosé blush or champagne which I'm really excited about. So, yeah, so I will see you there. I'm going to that. Thank you so much for listening and write a review. This week in Hoverland, we bought this house, this very this very big project of a house. And so basically every weekend, Mark is, spends 100%, I would say like 92% of his time at this house, like doing stuff around the house because it, it's completely um, like it needs to be remodeled and updated and there's trash all over the property. It's 26 acres of land and it's along like a road where it's clear that people just like dump on it. So he, that's what he has been doing, which is great because it needs to be done. But also it's like he ain't around, you know, so I'm still like, I would say. 92% like on mom duty with no dad and during the week he travels for work so during the week I'm 100% I would say like it's a mental load of coordinating and logistics I don't know some a friend of mine last week was like you should just get a nanny like full-time to like bring the kids to school drop them off pick them up and do all this stuff which it's I'm conflicted because it's like well I work for myself this is like the piece that I get to do I get to go pick up my kids from school every day I get to get them to school every day and like you know so that's supposed to be the part that I should I feel obligated like I get to do because I work for myself and I have flexibility but then it's like it, it definitely decreases my work day from like like a solid 10 to 3 is what I can work. And I got to eat lunch. It's the main course of my day. It's a, it's a priority to eat lunch. I mean, I get I get like most people like, oh, they can just bring their lunch. But I like to like really have lunch time. It's important to me. So, yeah, it's like it's a lot, a lot of coordinating. Because even though I do have plenty of help and I'm, I'm, I'm constantly leaning on people, I still have to coordinate that. I still have to, like, figure out what day so-and-so is watching kids, picking up kids and doing play dates and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's a lot. And then I do feel like with the house project, I need to do a better job departmentalizing because like normally I, I do feel like a sense of relief when Mark comes into town, like he comes home and I'm like, OK, now we got two of us to like, you know, divide and conquer or, or whatnot. But when he's coming home, he's like, and now I'm going to work on the house and stuff. So it's just like I got to like. I got to pivot. I got to like reorganize life. Okay. In the beginning, I, I think like at first you're like, oh God, I don't have this guy anymore. But in a lot of ways, it's like one less personality in the mix. There's like a power struggle when the two of us are there. Like the kids definitely act different when, when Mark is around. When Mark is not around, they know I am like the leader of the pack and what I say goes. But we have little, we have like different parenting styles for sure. Like Mark is all about like sitting at the dinner table, having dinner at night. You know what I'm saying? But like when Mark's not there, I like I'm fine to eat over the sink. I'm fine to do that. I'm fine to order takeout. I'm fine to go out to eat. I don't know. I just think like we have different like routines. Like there's a different routine when Mark is present physically there. And so some in a lot of ways, it's easier when he's not home because it's just like one less personality is what I'm trying to say. I mean, have you ever heard me say like when people are like, oh, how many kids you have? I say, you know, I have four if you count my husband. Because it is like another another person, another like, I mean, he is an adult and he's mature and he's responsible and all that stuff. But it is just like another being that you have to think about. I've also talked to people who have long, long standing marriages and their husband travels and they're like, it's the best. It's like, it's like, this is why we're still married because we have distance. We have time to miss each other. There's no monotony, you know, like it's, it's like we have like an on and off switch almost, which is nice. I literally use Mark and maybe this isn't healthy. I don't know what the textbook says these days because that shit changes over time too. 
the fact that like parenting trends and styles change with time is very apparent when my mom is in town. So she will point out, well, we let you have that when you were little, you turned out okay. And it's like, okay, I am not judging your parenting style. I'm very grateful for my upbringing. I think that they did the best they could. And I am awesome because of them, both of them, my mom and my dad, right? But the times they have a changed and there are some things you just can't get away with, like pushing your kid into a doorway and hurting their eye. Like Like, you'll get a call from CPS if that's mentioned at school. You know, you got to be careful. I don't know if it's right. Like, if the kids are not behaving themselves and me saying, I'm going to call your dad. I'm going to FaceTime dad right now if you don't get your ass in bed and go to sleep. I don't know if that's the right thing to do because, like, maybe I am, like, subconsciously making him out to be the bad guy. But they, they do get their asses in the bed when I threaten to call their dad. I mean, there's got to be some value to the good cop, bad cop thing. I also feel like issues come up, too, when, like, Mark does come in town and I'm just like, oh, my God, I just, I'm like, I want to, like, relax and lounge and just, like, I just have that sense of, like, relief that I can, like, kind of break down a little bit. And Mark's like, okay, well, like, then what am I supposed to be 100% parenting over the weekends? Like, I was just working all week, but he wasn't working simultaneously, like, also trying to organize doctor's appointments. Or we have this huge house project going on right now. Like, I got to communicate with the contractor, and I got to talk to the bank. There's just, like, loads. It's just, like, loads and layers of extra shadow work, like, You know, I don't know that Mark knows off the top of his head that Ruby wears a size two now in shoe. Like, it's those little, like, like all that little shit that you just are supposed to know as the primary parent. It's a lot. So on the weekends, I'm sometimes like, no, I do not want to wash clothes. I do not want to clean the house. I do not want to do shit. And I don't want to talk to my children. (laughs) (laughs) like can you do that and so it's I mean it's definitely a challenge so this is the other thing and maybe this is also sort of like this is maybe triggering or like applicable to resonates whatever you want to call it but like Mark can come home and go to the bathroom in peace he can take a shower in peace he can leave the house without even saying like hey Katie I'm going home or I'm going to the house or whatever he can literally just function and exist without ever having to touch base or see any children and I can come home after Mark's been home with the kids, go straight to the bathroom, go to take a shower. And it's like immediately I am sensed. They sense my presence. They want to be on top of me. And I don't think that's fair. And I don't know how to how do I turn that off? How do I like make how do I put out that like I need a minute? I need a hot beat. And Mark's always like, well, you're their mother. And I'm like, well, you're their father. Like, what is that? Like, I want to go to the bathroom in peace. And But I do, I don't know if you have this, but like I physically remember being at the bathroom door with my fingers underneath the door trying to get to my mom when she was in the bathroom. (laughs) And I remember her yelling out loud, like, I need a pee in peace. Like, give me a moment. Can I use the bathroom in peace? Like, I can hear her saying that when I'm now saying it to my children. And it's just, I think this is a universal side effect of being a mom. You can no longer use the bathroom in peace. They can, you cannot. Even if I do wake up in the morning, like I, like this morning, I woke up like at 630. As soon as I opened my eyes, I was like, (gasps) they know I'm up. (laughs) I have been in the bathroom like, you know, brushing my teeth or whatever, just like in the bathroom, in my personal space. Mm-hmm. And and Ruby, and not just Ruby, Posey and Zia will all come into that. Like they will each on separate occasions come in and say like, I need water. I'm like, well, where's your dad? Oh, he's in the kitchen. Oh, well, he's in the fucking kitchen. Like the thought doesn't occur to them to like ask him. So is there some energy he's putting out that's like, oh, ask your mother, go ask your mother. And then there's been several times, and this is something that I just need to, talk to Mark about but like I will come out of my personal space and like his car will be gone and I'll be like what what like like get like I just got out of the shower you know like getting ready for it I don't know like this is just a scenario and I like leave and I'm like wait like literally where is he you know but he just like went to Stewart's or went to go run an errand and it's like no there's no communication and I could never I could never just leave the house without touching base and be like, hey, you're here, right? You know? So, but maybe I'm just going to wait until 
he just leaves the house and I just leave the house and then we leave the kids alone. So my mom's going to come on Wednesday so we can like interview her. But she's got so many stories about how they just like left us at home to like deal, like eat, figure out what to eat. Don't burn the house down. Like just it, it was like I mean, you could never do that. I mean, I don't feel like you can really do that these days. She's got this great story about how my mom, like, I think my mom went to the grocery store and my dad, like, maybe was even at the house, but around in the yard or something. And we had a sliding glass door in the back. And my brother, like, took a baseball bat to the sliding glass door to, to break out. And he ran to the neighbor's house and was like, I don't know who my mommy and daddy are. And it was like, yeah, just like, and no big deal. Like, the neighbor was probably like, oh, no big deal. I'll, I'll you stay here. No, like the thought of like, or the fear, they had, they had no fear that they were going to be called by CPS. I also, also vividly remember like once I got into my sassy years, which if you ask her, I'm sure was like around how old Ruby is right now, like five, six years old. She used to like hand me the phone when I would say, I'm going to call CPS, I'm going to call Child Protective Services. And she would give me the phone. She'd be like, call them. Here's the, here's the phone number. Do you think you're going to have it better off somewhere else in a little orphanage or something? You, like, you got it real good, kid. You better, but she had no fear. She had no fear. Thank you for listening to this podcast. And if you want to connect with me, slide into my DMs on Instagram. My handle is Katherine Hover.